It is such a pleasure to be chatting with one of my favorite, favorite people in the mm. industry here, Mr. Charles Officer. Hello. Welcome. Hi, welcome. Good to see you again. It's always good to see you good. and yes. happy to have you as our Thank episode two of Real Inspiration because you're truly an inspiring person in mm. the industry. And I had not known so many things about you until I researched for this episode so let's <laughs> dig deep and okay. go back to the beginning sure Charles. sure let's do it because i think when i met you you were still acting i was yes was that was kind a of, long time ago it was a long time ago yep. and it was uh my kind of my, my introduction to filmmaking actually mm -hmm. yeah, yeah but you had a whole bunch of careers before mm. you went into acting mm -hmm. so let's just touch on those because <laughs> I think it might be interesting for the folks out there to learn some of your background yes. starting with pro hockey player yeah what yeah off to the UK and then you were you were drafted by yeah well Calgary Flames, Flames. and um, from when I was playing in Europe, they used to have a, you know, a European draft at the time. Now it's all amalgamated, but it was, yeah, it was, uh, I was very young. I, you know, I started playing hockey pretty late in terms of other kids in Canada, but in my neighborhood, it was like, you know, I, I, people had hockey sticks when Gretzky was on tip of everyone's mm -hmm. tongues. And I, and it was also, you know, trying to fit in, you're just trying to fit in. And so... But but the barriers there were, were very interesting, and in because I also realized that my mother, being a, 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 the black Jewish mother that she is, you know, and uh, you observe the Sabbath, Sabbath, and when you're young playing hockey, you you know hockey practice and have on Saturday. Yeah, I don't think stuff. hockey hockey no, honors not the really, Sabbath. No, not at all. <laughs> and but this woman would like set up my my bus route and like put out the bus fare and say go. And uh, I'd walk into these rooms as the only, you know, black person mm -hmm. and already just face a certain sort of judgment, which was terrifying. But and then, you know, then you get on the ice and, and then you, you prove who you are and then you have a lot of friends after, apparently. And it was also, so I realized in my later life that she was teaching me a lesson, like, to actually what this world can be like. And I can, and, and, and through that translation to what I do now, I've, I've seen the same display, the same principles, the same sort of reactions and situations that, it, that, that I feel like I was prepared for. You know? Yeah, I was wondering about that, whether your entree into the hockey world was similar to the arts world, because Absolutely. you would think that they might be very different, no. right? Because yeah. artists are so accepting mm -hmm. and we're so mm -hmm. giving and inclusive. Right. I found Not that, so no, like I, when I applied, like I, out of the three students that applied to OCAD, like um, my final year of, of high school, I actually failed that art class. And I'm the only student that got into OCAD. They had no idea what I was doing outside of class or what was inspiring me. And when I, when I remember, I'll never forget that my first interview uh, or my interview, I brought my portfolio to OCAD. And, and there were two individuals that were interviewing me and they were just like staring at me like, mm -hmm. you know. And then one stopped and said, you speak such good English. Oh, wow. And I, and, wow. And, I, and, I, and I looked at him very confused and, uh, and I said, I was born here. And I just, but I was so innocent and mm -hmm. I just went on with talk. I was so obsessed with talking about my work and, and nervous and all these things. And, and that's also when they introduced me to, they said, do you know an artist named Basquiat, Jean-Michel Basquiat? And I said, I have no idea who that is. But always just like tearing on this sort of like cultural connection of mm -hmm. like, who is this person? And uh, I went there to that school, but everywhere I have been in the majority of the places that I have occupied through my career, prof different professions, I've been the only one, mm -hmm. you know? So um, it was fascinating. Um, it's fascinating to see the, the, the societal sort of um, structures and the way things actually are and w where you land in things and, mm -hmm. and things that are like, you know, not the most welcoming. You know. And isn't it funny how the more things change, the more they stay the same? Like, Absolutely. that was how long ago? 20 years ago? Oh, my ago? God, 20 years ago. Like, it was, I was a teenager, and I was, you know, really exposed to what it meant to be a professional as well. Right. Where, when, where even hockey wasn't just for fun or a game. When you play, made that transition from, 
you know, into that professional sort of when they're paying you, mm -hmm. you got to perform. Yeah. They'll ship you out. They'll fire you. They will pl replace you faster than you can actually call your mother to say I'm coming home. Like, it's it's that kind of business and that sort of wake up call is was was also a big preparation of the world in a way before I I moved into this way of art. I worked in graphic design. I was a creative director. It was like I've seen how advertising and dollars are spent and and what the priorities are and becoming a part of a mechanism that is actually selling something that you didn't believe in was when I had a turn in my in my in my head of like how do you you know nurture these creative skills and put it towards something that's actually tangible that's something that you care about mm -hmm. rather than being in continuous service and that's when I was 23 and switched yeah so that's something that I thought was very interesting that um you have all the background kind of necessary to be a good, not a good filmmaker necessarily, but to be a prepared filmmaker. Mm. You've got the business background a little bit, yeah. you know, you understand sort of that yes. corporate world. You've obviously got an artistic background of many ways. And then you've got sort of that real life kind of experience mm. of the sports world that is probably the harshest. Yeah. Especially for people of color, especially, especially back then. Yes, especially. You know, back not then. necessarily that things have changed too much now, because right? I don't know how many. Okay, maybe it's a little bit different for black hockey players, but how many Indian hockey players are there? Well, there. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's still like this, and and I see it now, even with you know, the National Hockey League trying to address these sort of things, but. But it's like, you know, bringing Willie. I knew about Willie O'Ree before he was, like, way before he was even, his name was mentioned in the, in the vocabulary of the NHL on mm -hmm. some sort of official way. And I'm saying it's like, I'm against it. It's like, it's, for me, it's more like it's about time, you know? Yeah. Um, just like, you know, a year ago or weeks ago, it's like there are still these racial incidents that happen for black players on that professional level. Mm -hmm. You know, the young players, like, I still stay very, very um, in tune with the young players that are coming up. Like, a young player who, he actually scored the, the winning goal of the World Junior Championships just this year, is the son of a hockey player that I grew up playing with. Oh, wow. They were the few That's full players. Of, so, his pro career ended in, 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 in the States, and then so he had his, you know, quite a few children, and this young player... Um, was really, really excelling in Florida, and they decided to come back to Toronto. It being a place for him, he was that he was just too good. And I think he was 12, turning 13. And then he, you know, he set record in the OHL. He's been drafted by the LA, Clink, LA Kings. He's, you know, a different generation, but but I can't say that he's exempt from ex these experiences mm -hmm. and these ideas, you know. Um, about like certain players, there's a kid, Josh Hosang, who's like sitting, he's so talented, but he's sitting in the minor system because they say he's too outspoken. He has, he has behavioral issues and, you know, that... For speak, is it, I, I don't know that player, but is it for speaking his truth? He's or speaking about, his truth yeah. or just having personality, <clears throat> like P.K. Subban, like certain players, because there's this line in this sort of idea of how you present yourself, it's so restrained, it's so like, you hear like hockey players in interviews and you hear, it's, you know, it's hard to distinguish who's who sometimes, because it's such this way, but you know, the personalities of, of um, these players is what I think we see in other sports, mm -hmm. basketball, baseball, and football, and yeah. they create this sort of, you know, juice around the game. Anyway, um, but I learned a lot from that game. I mean, from the discipline of it, you know, having to be up at like, you know, five in the morning and be, no one had to like set a, an alarm clock for, you know, for me to be on time and be there. And I think it's just like filmmaking, you have to be, I mean, we just shot my latest film, we shot nights, Ooh. like three weeks. Which you just wrapped, which we're Yeah, we just finished. And which is fiction, your return. It's fiction, it's return fiction. of fiction, Aquila's Escape. So I'm excited about putting this one out mm -hmm. in the world. It's, uh, despite what anyone says, if they like it or feel it or not, there hasn't been a film that, has, that feels like this in this country. Yeah. Well, I want to get back to the whole speaking your truth later, yes. because that does seem to be your 
approach to filmmaking and it's very personal to you, mm -hmm. stop looking at my notes. You're not going to see what I'm asking you. It's I won't look. I won't. I won't. I won't. I promise. <laughs> but, okay. So we've, we've gone from hockey, then we're in OCAD and you mm. had a brief career in the ad world as yes. creative director. Uh, then you decided to go into acting mm. and you went to the neighborhood playhouse in New York, which I, I didn't know that as, mm -hmm. as well. I knew you as an actor, but I didn't know that that was your mm. acting background. What right. was that experience like in New York for it you? It turned everything that was amazing. First, I have to you know, speak about the how I even got there was mm -hmm. uh, there was a class going on. I was a graphic designer at the time and I don't know, I was approached to do something I didn't really know and I said I should take an acting class. and. From that year that I graduated from high, uh, from OCAD, I put this flyer in my portfolio, and then two years later, I, I pulled it out and called this woman, and her name is Jacqueline McClintock. She's oh, yeah. out of Montreal. She's touched a lot of amazing talent out of this country. So I walked into this class, and that's where I met Ingrid Venninger. Long-time you know, collaborator. Yes, yours. absolutely. And Scott Speedman was there. I first met Sarah Pauly. It's like... Uh, you know, semi cellist David Willington. That was some class. You no, know, it was a list of people that I had no clue who and what I knew. Someone I was like, she, I've seen her on television. Yeah. And and to see them all in this this group and what they were practicing and what they were working on and 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 it was Jacqueline who wrote me the letter to go to the neighborhood playhouse because she had, she had went there and you had to get referred and all mm -hmm. this stuff and she's the one that brought it up to me and I was like. I've never, like, what is the name of the What a weird name of, a, of what is it? I had no idea what Should it was. Should we tell people what it is? Yeah, tell it's, it's, it a, is, it's a theater school in New York. Um, and it's like Sanford Meisner, who is this amazing person. Um, you know, there was this uh, group of, of, of actors and, and who formed this group in, in New York. And, and they basically kind of broke off in their different philosophy. You know, there's Stanislavski. And, you know, people think about different things and uh, Stella Adler and these schools. But Sanford Meisner had a real specific concept technique, about yeah. technique. I, 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 I try not to use the word technique because I think when we can call it that, but I think it's like... You know, for me, the core of what um, the philosophy is is an ounce of behavior is worth a pound of words, and to you know tell the truth under imaginary circumstances. And I think there is something, but he's always talking about telling the truth. And I mm -hmm. think there are techniques to get you there, but ultimately you have to tell the truth. And I think that's trying to get you know the philosophy of the most authentic way of presenting telling story. You know, which is an emotional experience, which is an exciting experience, a visceral experience, all these things, but telling the truth in it. And uh, and that's a big thing to think about. And it was when I went to this school, she wrote me this letter, and I was, uh, I wrote my first short script there. Also because in a class of 40, I was the only black person. Even in New York, huh? Even in New wow. York. I mean, because it is an international school. I mean, there was a there was a young there was a young woman in the other class, and she was she was biracial, and you know, so there's like two. It wasn't very even still because these sort of things, theater schools and stuff, no matter all these amazing talents, it's so hard for talent to even find itself in this community to even think that that's an option. That is a hundred percent true. Yeah. And then can they afford it? Right. Right. So yeah. the but not saying that they're not there. Or they could have done that, but in high school they had to, you know, try to apply to something else that was, or they were just geared towards, you know, I think you should be a carpenter because you're good with your hands, mm -hmm. rather than pursuing the arts, you know, mm -hmm. you won't make it in the arts, or unless you're like, you know, so absurdly talented that people can't deny it, but we, I haven't, I mean, my generation, it, that wasn't happening in theater school, the topical school of the arts, or the art schools in our city, Rosedale or whatever. Yeah. There weren't black kids there coming out like, like you know what I mean? Yeah, it I was do. still an exclusive mm -hmm. club. Club. So, so my teacher failed me in my grade, and they didn't know that I was doing that. I had an artistic inclination, even mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's not encouraged, and the talent's right there. Right. But some students are. But you got right? through. I did. And it was just like the path of, of, of un unknowns. I was curious about it. And that's when I wrote my first short script was when I was at theater school. And that's why I chose not to go back. I decided to come back and try and make a film. Also but what was it about, sorry to interrupt, yeah, what was no, it about so, being in theater school yes. that made you think, I'm going to write a script? 
because I was the only one. And I remember I was double casting these two show, um, scenes that you know that you have to present, and it was like one was The Hustler, and one was Barefoot in the Park. And I was a little, a little confused because we're talking about Paul Newman mm -hmm. in one, and then you know Robert Redford in another role. And I'm like, how do I even connect to this material? But also, so, I was so young that to even understand what those scenes were really, it's like, no, I didn't have that life experience to really like kind of understand what those scenes were about. But you have to do them. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, where are the stories that actually? that speak to things that I can actually really relate to that's from my cultural diaspora, then I start to go to the bookstore, the bookstores, the theater bookstores and stuff, and I started hunting for plays by you know, black playwrights and things and seeing if there was anything that was even a little more contemporary or closer to what I was thinking. I was making these discoveries and I decided that if I want to try this thing, because I was still technically, you know, a... Uh, when I left graphic design, the company I was working for, I went to quit and they said, take a leave of absence, but I didn't know what that meant. And they said, they explained to me, they said, so I can go away for a year and then come back and have a job? And they're like, yeah, that's what we're saying. Right. So I was going to come back, decide what I was going to do, because I was going to up upheave my life of working design. I loved what I was doing to a degree, I just wasn't sure where, but to go off and do this dream of being an actor, like, I didn't know if I, I didn't even know what it was yet. Right. So I decided to write a short script and I would act in it. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that in New York and decided not to go to go back to school and decided that I was going to try to make my first film, but not to show anybody, just to see if I liked acting. You've kind of been yeah. really good at everything you've tried so far. In in the tale of Charles Officer, up to the right. point of writing your first short script. Like, you excelled at hockey, you right. tried it, you excelled at it. Right. You got into art school, you excelled at it, you got a job, where they were gonna let you come back after a year. That's, That's it happens, cool. but it doesn't happen a lot. Right, and you don't, re well, I didn't realize that sort of thing, and sometimes I can look back and be like, wow, you lucky little duck, like, how did you, how did that even happen, or, um, well, but well, we all I know was, that their luck is not just luck. It sure. Is, you know, preparation and yes. timing. And I'm obsessive too. Like I, 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 I um, like so. Yeah, even with hockey, when when I saw that that you know you're picking up the sticks in the playground and all the and you're and I said I'm Wayne Gretzky and some kids like no you're not you can't be and I'm like oh it means I gotta get better when I'm good enough like even when I was good they'd say you still can't be grassy I was like oh so it's a racial thing right so you're saying I can't do this huh all right I love it when people tell me I can't do something up for a challenge yeah so so it was like okay all right I'll quietly practice every day where my mom's like where are you <laughs> going what are you doing it's like 30 below outside why are you going to play mm -hmm. hockey are you why but I mean like I'm going hours yeah. there'll be nobody there because it's too cold to go outside i'm out there but it was like that with our school <laughs> i became obsessed with it and then with filmmaking i had no idea like the demands of it you know i had no idea of how many things you have to learn to do this one thing mm -hmm. you know so and it's something that you you keep learning each time you do it that's kind of it's a scary and the most beautiful thing about it it's always Different because you're not telling the same story, hopefully. Well, it depends on what you choose to do with. But if you're, each story is teaching you or you have to go somewhere to learn something new, it's beautiful. It's like you, you, you actually get to learn more about yourself and, and, and explore different avenues, something. So, and, and not rely, and if you're looking at that story, dictating how you're going to tell it or present it, then it means you haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. So it's always new in that capacity which is which is exciting but it's always like from ground zero again you know in a way to build a story or like architecture and build a foundation design it it's like make sure this foundation's actually solid and and then build 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 then you leave it there and then it kind of stays there for everyone to see you know yeah. it's kind of forever and ever forever and ever until unless someone lights it and erases it off of every drive or something or, but it's yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting progression. Yeah. 
I want to talk a little bit about that work ethic that you have because mm -hmm. you know the title of this podcast is Real Inspiration and it's really right. to try and inform and inspire the emerging right. artists, yes. whether they're actors, directors, producers, writers, whatever um, their calling is. And I've heard a lot of people in the industry, more senior people in the industry, mm. talk about how a lot of the emerging talent doesn't necessarily come with that work ethic. Mm. Do you, do you first of all think that that work ethic is necessary to make it in this industry? Is talent enough? Right. And if if it is uh, mm -hmm. necessary, then do you agree that that's something that's missing these days? Right. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> I think it's. I'll just speak on the sort of if talent is enough part. I think I think it's not. I think there's and just by way of of the way that uh, I don't think it's fair. That sometimes someone I've seen so many individuals who are very talented and and not this, get this kind of shot or the opportunities that others do that aren't as talented and it, so I I do see that this business is you know in a way or this sort of the way this this business has been colonialized even the way when I use that term I mean in the way it's been structured and, and kept in a certain way. Right. I'm not talking about like one person doing it. It's a collective of people who have yeah. kept it this way. It's you know it's not going to be one person to dismantle it or to, you mm -hmm. know or to shift the way it moves. But there's a way, and even the way that we start tell stories, it's been uh, or told. And you know all these screenwriting books you read early on, you're like, oh wait a minute, culturally this isn't the way actually we tell stories for mm -hmm. me. But this is the way it's been imposed that the way right. that they so you, I've got to fit into so that. you got to fit into this. So this whole cinema and, and television everything is you know came from a certain idea and principles that I think were, were, were astute from the first films that were made were one of the, the biggest colonialist individuals you mm -hmm. know set a certain tone and we found this medium that's the most magical and the most incredible and the most effective that in the hands of other cultures and stuff has become the magic I think right. of it that's when we've seen these sort of things where we're talking about how did a Korean film win the best Academy Award? Absolutely. Like, you know, because that person has brought their culture into the way that they tell stories within this way that we've been, we, yeah. we consume it and breaks it. Yeah. And does something Shakes that's fresh and bit. does something that we've never seen before, um, which is beautiful. But so, but I think, I think you, you know, opportunity and, and sometimes, you know, I think that majority of individuals, when they work, I, I hope to think they work pretty hard that they get to a place where they at least they get one shot. Right. It doesn't happen with a lot of people of color. Mm -hmm. And even when we do get a shot, we don't get a second one if we mess up. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? So, so there is this thing about talent, but talent is often overlooked, I think. And, but do you uh, think that's because the people who are making the decisions are... Yeah, I think it always comes. I think it always absolutely the only there was an amazing article that came out a couple of weeks. I had to share with everybody in the refinery about, it, and the question was, why is Canadian television so white? Mm -hmm. And this this conversation, this thing, isn't like delicate to talk about because I grew up in this country and it's always been this yeah. way. So if something's always been a certain way. Why is it uncomfortable to talk I about? Know. Right? Like so, the the point is is that it's a real valid question mm -hmm. and that question can only be answered when there are individuals in positions executive positions who can green light projects and live in that sort of place that is close to folks to champion projects th that they you know they can see the validity of, of actually putting out in the world mm -hmm. it's it's that's exactly the the song and the dance is to you know I'll get asked like you know for certain broad like an extra 10 questions. We have to validate it so elsewhere more, yeah. before it could be validated here, but it's a story about here and experiences from this country. Yeah. It's like this um, idea that we are committed to these changes because so that's why I say that talent sometimes is enough because I have friends who've been struggling and, and working for a long time that are getting their breaks or whatever we want to say it now, but they've been here. And they're still really really great to hire on a project mm -hmm. but not to lead your own got it yeah right not given so we can't best. so we say that this is a breakthrough to get hired for something when people have been talented and ready to yeah. go for many years 
And then we hear this sort of backlash of individuals saying, well, taking our jobs away, or certain mm -hmm. folks, you know, are, are threatened that there's going to be apparently that there's enough people of color out there that are even qualified to take that many jobs is absurd mm -hmm. because the training and the sort of experience that you need to make a feature film or to get hired and work in um, you know hour long television or to get hired by a network and stuff they're not just hiring people off the street <laughs> right you have to have done certain things to yeah. get there and that disparity alone is what keeps is why there isn't a lot of diversity in these places because actually they there's a gap in the training mm -hmm. and and having those skill set to be able to handle those jobs right so that's a catch-up right now and um so even still your jobs are what you're threatened by two three people who can actually that you're competing with suddenly yeah. you know so i just i find it fascinating that you know this idea that we see these mandates and pledges about gender parity and and uh, diversity. And I'm going to be bold and say it, but it's like diversity is not just indigenous programs. Absolutely. There are there are many other groups that if we're talking about and and I and I love my indigenous brothers and sisters and they're basically I've seen that problem, but I feel like this this idea that the systems and, and, and folks they think that if they're gonna you know, put all their, their eggs into just, you know, indigenous projects and stuff and then still say, well, we can't find other ones mm -hmm. elsewhere is a lie. It's like, it's, it's a lie. Yeah. You know, you know, um, you know, diversity isn't employing a lot of unqualified white women either. Right. Exactly. Yep. When I was, um, I'm saying it. I'm, I like that you're saying it. Thank you that we're get back to the speaking your truth. I feel like we've been having this conversation. I've been in diversity conversations mm -hmm. for the last 20 years in yeah. film and TV. Yeah. I feel like I've seen you around the table. Yes. Every five years, we have the same conversation. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks, they hem and they haw, they write things down. Nothing happens, and five years later, we're having the same conversation. Absolutely. But when I was chairing the ACTRA diversity uh, committee, we used to say that diversity means everybody. That's right. It means also the white people. Well, that's what I'm saying. It yes, means yes, everybody makes yes, a diverse yes, community. Yes, absolutely. I kind of feel like lately there have been fads to diversity. Yes. You know, it was like gender parity was Absol the thing for yes, a while. Yes. We're going to do 50-50. Exactly. Great. Love it. Love it. We've achieved that in some areas. You know, yes. some Have you been training these women? He's also invested in training them. Right. Right? And preparing them and not like, you know, hey, we're going to do this thing and then let you, like, leave you at the edge and just drop yeah. by yourself. You have, have fun. No, have fun. Bye. And then it's like, wait a minute. You know, let's take the steps, like, mm -hmm. to help to prepare people that they're actually skilled, that they're quote, ready, and actually, guess what? It elevates the work that we're doing, mm -hmm. that, we, that we stand by and that we put out there. And so that you're, do, if you're running a program, don't you want people to be celebrating you because you've made such great choices with the films Absolutely. that you funded and people are like, wow, I love look, at look at all the talent that's coming out of it. look at all the coming out of it. Like, is that not our goal? Right. You know, so we have to take that time to actually, you know, because there are ambitious, hungry, and, and talented individuals that have been wanting opportunities. And I've, I've seen kind of the, the bizarreness of it where, even some filmmakers who I've seen who are female that have more experience and maybe should have an opportunity, and they're not. They're getting jumped by, which brings mm -hmm. back to like a generation thing. Mm -hmm. um, is like there's a different, you know, perspective on how to achieve success now with generation of millennials than mine. Like, I also grew up in a household where it was like you have to work four times as hard as that average person just yeah. to get an opportunity and I got to let go of some of that stuff because it becomes a bit of a problem <laughs> like you know but you're being prepared that way and then we see this sort of world where the people are becoming instant sort of fame and I have 10,000 followers so I believe that I deserve this opportunity mm -hmm. well you got to do the work first like maybe make some short films maybe we'll, you know explore your craft like want to learn about it like have a have a way that you want to approach, like, it's fascinating, even with driving a car, you probably put more time, you have to do the driver's ed. <laughs> exactly. You gotta go to this thing. And then you gotta actually yeah, do a test, a test. Yep. before you can actually Written jump out. And Written practical. and practical. <laughs> but here in filmmaking, one oh, of the gosh. biggest things in television, because I remember there was a period where 
if I said, if one more person comes to me to pitch me with an odd television concept and they reference The Wire, I'm going to uh -huh. like... I don't uh -huh. want to like lose my mind. Cause, Spec script? Because everyone watches something like, I want to make that. Right. And they don't see the work like a David Simon or the research of the world and the, what it takes to actually make mm -hmm. something that great. And then it's like, I would just want to jump in because, I mean, I have 10,000 followers. Right. I deserve it. It's like, okay. okay. <laughs> so this is coming back to my sort of original yeah. question to this. Do I understand across is, the board? Because I know no, some no, young folks it. who are so on point and working their butts off and smart, and I'm behind them. I'm trying to help them. Yeah. And uh, so I believe it's a mixture. It's just a different approach. Mm -hmm. you know? But just in terms of, you know, the talent isn't necessarily enough. You need to have that work ethic. You, I believe, I mean, if you don't, if you come unprepared, if you're not taking it seriously, if you're not actually trying to challenge yourself to do something with the opportunity or this medium or something you're trying to do, I think you'll get called out eventually. Mm -hmm. You're going to, it'll be bland, it'll be something. Something's going to, you can only take that so far because I think the ones who have good work ethic and have vision and they keep going are the ones that are people uh, people will eventually pay attention to the days of fake it till you make it maybe not so much anymore not so much i think you can fake it till you make it but then like how do you sustain it right you know i think once you i think you're lucky if you fake and you make it then it's like hope you were faking it to make it because you had a you're like i'm going to work my butt off if i get there i'm not just going yeah, to coast i just know? need that one, just big need that opportunity, one opportunity and then i'm going to kill it and i'm going to lie because i had to fake it at the film center like you know it was sad because, you know, I made my first film and it did pretty well, but, you know, applying to the film center was a, my first experience in a film school environment. It's not even a film school, like, like Sarah Pauly is there, like people have made features, people have made three short films, it's like, they've already went to film school, and I was, I was like, oh gosh, uh, I didn't know what access was. I knew what it was visually, but I didn't know the term. Mm. And so, you know, you're in this program that you're supposed to be among the eight top filmmakers in the country, or apparently, or whatever. You're selected for this program, and this sort of program, and you don't even understand the terminology. And right. you're like, okay, I better do some homework tonight and every night. And so mm -hmm. I was just learning as I was going. Your but obsessiveness it, it was, kicked in, did it? Well, I had to. Had to. Because I had to. I had to learn it. I had to know what what was happening yeah. I had to so so yeah I wouldn't say I faked it I just didn't know that I didn't know <laughs> right right but at least you once you knew that you didn't know I you learned yeah you found out not yeah. everybody I think takes that extra step right but I think you got to it's like this thing filming into like it's it's I would say that it's like you know I've tried golf a couple of times because I always thought that <laughs> hockey players would be great at golf. It's random, uh -huh. and it was just you know it's this thing that's synonymous with like oh if you're a hockey player they all they all golf in the off season. Right? Apparently, so do basketball players. Basketball players, everyone golf. So it's like it's a zen thing. I just mm -hmm. don't understand it personally, and I everyone <laughs> thought so. I tried it. and I'm terrible at it, and I was say that writing and filmmaking and golf are the like the hardest things I've ever done in my life. It's it's it is it is it is not like. I mean, but if it, but it's not supposed. There's a lot of things that are hard out there to do. Yeah. You know, nursing is hard. Um, it's, but it is something that I think it, it it takes a certain kind of muscle to to keep going with it because mm -hmm. there's so many factors that are like waiting to say no. It's not a yes business <laughs> in a way, right? right? Like At least not for. For certain everybody. folks, no. The folks aren't like banging down your door, my yeah. door, and being like, hey, what do you want to make? Yes! It's like, huh? Yeah, well, I got time. Okay, yeah, what do, what do you want to make? Okay, uh, and here's a list of questions, mm -hmm. and uh, why, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but at times I think it's, I've seen a lot of hoops that folks have to jump to kind of clarify. I've seen projects greenlit on less, is what I'm just trying to say oh, in certain yeah. situations, mm -hmm. and who who the dice is being rolled on and and I think that's got a shift mm -hmm. it's got a shift and we need people in positions that uh that see the value of of the diaspora the broad stories that exist on this soil it's uh we have so many amazing stories and we're, we're you know Toronto's a bit of a bubble but being the most multicultural city yeah. in the country it's like don't we want to lead that example and mm -hmm. just let it exe exemplify? And, you know, when we talk about, you know, executives or use the term, our audience, our audience, I'm like, who's this audience? 
Right. Am I a part of that audience? Right. Is my mother? Is my sister? Because the landscape of the of the country has been shifting. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people come here. You know,、um, and live in other places that you probably don't expect.、Mm -hmm. You know, so it's amazing、uh, that we have. I'm hoping that, but I do see a beautiful thing with the generation as well that's coming up. That they, they're taking space. You know, yeah, they're saying that we're here and we want to do stuff and we we actually want to be seen in certain places and and that's it's 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 less of a timid. Yeah, there's a bit of a, an arrogance almost. To yeah, it, you kind of you, you need you a need little, it. You need, you need some it. confidence. You to need make some it. of that, like、yeah. in, in 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 definitely in athletics, and、mm -hmm. you cannot go into. These situations, thinking I'm going to lose, right? Or else you will, and、yeah. and no matter the opponent, like you have to believe that you are better. You have to believe that you you're going to win, and and you're going to do everything in your power to do that, and、mm -hmm. and you're going to do that for your teammate, and you do that thing, and you rally, and you move, and and that's a beautiful thing about team sport too. But it's like, you know, one on one, you know, boxing match. It's like you can't go into that fight thinking, oh man. I'm gonna lose. This guy's stronger than well, me. Well, then you might as well just you save yourself the boxers, the, bo the exactly, cauliflower ears. Exactly. Exactly. Right. right? Yeah. So, Speaking of which, you also had back, some boxing in your background, didn't that, you? Yes, I still love it. I still love it. I still, yeah. It's, well, let's、uh, segue then into Nurse Fighter Boy. Just talking about that film,、right. which was kind of a breakout for you. Yes. Right. Your big breakout. What did it get? Like ten genie noms. Yeah, the former. Yeah, the, the new Now CSA, the CSA Awards. It's.、Um, Yeah, it was the first、Ten. film. Yeah, it was pretty、so、good for、bad. the first film. It was it was pretty it was it was, was overwhelming. It, was it pretty good? It was it was it was pretty good. It was pretty pretty, amazing, huh? pretty. It was really. I look back, I'm like, wow. It's like, that was a lot. And、um, but you know, and at the same time, it's amazing. It's like if that. It's wild. Just volume and sort of thing. It's not to compare or whatever, but but even after that, like. There were a lot of individuals that were like, "We love your work, and we want to see what you do and stuff." And it was, again, like, like I could have not have made another film, and、mm -hmm. I don't think anyone really gave a shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it was, it was an amazing time for again another reality check of, you know, Clark Johnson always bugging, yeah, the only guy who you know get ten、uh, Genie nominations in the Canadian Oscars and like takes such a long time to make his his next、mm -hmm. you know fiction film. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like it's. Cause that was the last one. No, that's you fiction, made, yeah. Yeah, that was the last fiction. Yeah. Cause Mighty Jerome, it was. That was a dog. Was a dog. On our versus a dog. It was less than a dog. Yeah. And, and now、uh, your new one. And now my new one is、uh, so the fifth feature, but like second narrative,、uh, something that I wrote.、Mm -hmm. And sometimes, though, you know, I do realize as well that that. That you have ideas of things you want to make, and and you have to grow also as well. Sometimes the project is ahead of you. Yeah. Your life experience and and some things. If I had made it, you know, ten years ago, it wouldn't be what、you、it is ready now. To make it. I don't think、saying? so. I think、yeah. I would. Even if I did, it would have been a different thing. You know, I think what I was trying to talk about it. Oh, I had to live some more experiences.、Mm -hmm. I think I had to find the right partner who I didn't、right. know at the time to actually make the film. Right. So that was also a thing too. Like sometimes, you know, you're not making something as well because you're still to meet somebody who's supposed to really be the person to help you to make it. Yeah. You know,、uh, because that project went through a few different, a couple of producers and different, and was put away and came back and like I don't want to work on it anymore. It's kind of like. You know,、um, and you do other things, and I fell in love after I made my first doc. That I didn't even—I wasn't aware of this medium so much, and I wasn't—I didn't imagine making documentaries.、Mm -hmm. So, so that was a, a whole eye-opening form of storytelling that I was like, I love this. This is great, and、um, and opportunities came there as well.、Right. So, and and so it all informed. Forms filmmaking and storytelling to me.、So. It would have been so interesting if this, if there was limitless money in the Canadian industry,、mm. for you to have made your current film、um, mm. back then when you originally wanted to,、right. and then make it again today, just to see how that would be. What, what an experiment that would be, huh? That would be incredible.、Oh, I just came up with the best. That's、idea. a dream. That's that. actually a great idea. Yeah. That is a great idea. I remember there was this film the. 
I want 10%. If you ever okay. do that. Okay. 15, All right, maybe. then. 15. 10%. You pro- you I have, undershot myself. You have to, no, you, you have to produce it. I'll be fair with you. <laughs> I know I you got would. You. I know you would. Um, but yeah, you'll be, you'll take that executive producer. And I, and awesome. Uh, yeah, you get your cut. Love to see my name in the credits <laughs> like that. Executive produced by. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Conceived and thought uh-huh. of and, you know. <laughs> Given to Charles. There you go. Just <laughs> hand it to him. Um, let's, I just want to say, I was looking at your production company website. Yeah. Cane Sugar Films. And I love your mantra. Mm. So I'm just going to read a little sure. bit of it here. You say you are defined by a magnitude of stories that cross cultural borders, but always come from within. Mm. We collect and we protect. Yeah. It's so poetic. Yeah. What do you mean by that, we collect and we protect? Um... I think I think it's project actually. Is it? Yes, but we do protect in that projection. So I love that you said that, because I went to school when I was okay with with an amazing designer and uh, Joel Gregorio, and he has a company, um, Sovereign State. And when we went into doing this, I was just like, because I hate being online and all this stuff. I said, let's talk with a friend, somebody and to help us design it and to challenge us what we are are what mm-hmm. we are about. We do these sessions. And these words came out of the, the session okay. um, of what we do. And, and he asks, I mean, he, he goes through it. Like, like almost like, what animal are you? Are you, right. in, in, what kind of individual? What kind of this? What kind of character? What human being is this? What kind of person is this yeah. thing that we're feeding into? And, um, and I love the way, the way that we narrowed down these words. And it became about, we actually go out and we collect stuff. We're inspired by these stories, and then we got to collect all this stuff to put it together, and then pr- project it out. Mm-hmm. But we got to protect that story. We have got to protect that with, even to the simple point of sometimes having to ask someone to leave the project mm-hmm. that you've been working with right. on other projects, because you have to protect this project. Mm-hmm. That if this person or or something isn't like. really pulling their thing for that project. You have yeah. to protect the project. I have to let go of my ego to protect the project. Sure. So it's it's like, it's a philosophy. It's simple, but it's like, because a lot of things get in the way. You know. Like what? W- well. Like ego, I'm sure. Like ego, mm-hmm. money. Of course. When money's on the table, people shift, mm. right? And then, it, and then it's not about protecting the thing anymore. Yeah. I'm not saying across the board, but I'm saying that these no, are you. real things that you face as you are working. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the ownership of ideas, even. Mm-hmm. You know, in this collaborative sort of world that you're making things, there still needs to be some sort of team captain. There are assistant and co-captains, mm-hmm. and you're trying to m- make the thing. So when even when there's a problem between, like, you know, a gaffer in your production designer or something like that. It's like, guys, or ladies and gentlemen, people, protect the thing. Right. Because something else is getting in the way. And, and you're like actually not protecting it. Mm-hmm. So that's something just kind of, uh, that we remind ourselves of because it's, 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 there are a lot of factors that can take you off course. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Now the other part of your website in the about you mm. section says, I collect stories of broken hearts, mm. love, justice, and equality. But what I like to collect most are intimate moment to moment experiences. Yeah. I feel like that is um, something that I look for in like the scene work, you know, if I'm directing television, it's like really what is the, even quietly for myself, like what is the, the intimate moment here of whether it's a crime scene or it's mm-hmm. like a, a larger scene or something between the characters. Like, w- there's always something intimate that someone's trying to, you know, convey. it's like convey or there's a secret or, um, and the details of that is what I think is what is amazing. And cinema allows you to do that. Theater's a little detailed, but you gotta present it like you hit the back of a room. Cinema, you can do it with, you know, a, a lens and a camera, and, and you can do it all in, in one shot. You can get it, convey a lot. Mm-hmm. And so, 
I think that's the magic of it, and it just reminds me of looking for those details that I miss too. But it's like, you know, but what are the ones that uh, that have emotional resonance? So, um, but it's it's challenging when you're working with with various people and having to, and we all don't learn the same way or taking information the same way. So why do we assume that actors or performers need to be communicated in the mm -hmm. same way? You have to be adaptable in the way that you communicate or I feel like I have to be so I can actually get to the heart of things and that intimate relationship that someone has with whatever they're doing and um, because it's intimate work it's intimate relations it's all intimate yeah. to be in someone's home to do a documentary or get to know them get close to somebody is intimate actors and writing and sitting hours with a production designers is or design it's intimate mm -hmm. with your DP it's intimate and even just being on set with being the same set, people for 23 absolutely. days or nights, nights. as you, you it's know, It's an that, intimate relationship, yeah. and, uh, which is beautiful. And I think that's why when you go in together and when you disband, it's like it's painful. Yeah. You know? It's like summer camp is over. Right? It is. And you're like, we want it. And even how hard you're sweating, you're like, oh, why did I do I this? You're like, we can't do this. Yes. And then you're like, when oh. do I see you again? When can we do this again? Let's do this again. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. It is incredible. And then you get to share it with, you go away and then share it with folks again and they get to remember, oh man, this is where we put our energy and this yeah. is where we spent that night and that's when we, that light broke. All the memories come back. Yeah. It's incredible. It is. It's a gift. Yeah. Now, we're coming up to the CSAs this year. Yes. And your latest doc, and we actually spoke last year about we this did, doc. We did. So it's so it was so nice to see that you've been nominated yeah. for best documentary yeah. for the Invisible es Invisible Essence, the Little Prince. Yes. Such a sweet, beautiful, touching Thank you. touching film that you so wrote kind. about the book. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, that project was something that was kind of it came to me as, a, as, a, as an idea it wasn't that I thought of specifically and uh, but because I love that book so much when I was at OCAD it was the first time I read it too mm -hmm. and and um, I always felt that there was this you know it's a magic realistic piece of art and I can say that even during the course of making it reading things over reading things over there were things that I had questions about and still didn't understand or want to know what other people thought of it, what was their interpretation yeah. but somehow you still felt something this really about it even though your interpretation could be a little bit different so and that's beautiful beauty of literature and books it's like the way you feel it's yeah. it becomes yours you know and it's uh and you can describe it to someone else and they can get you but they still will have their own right and i love I, yeah. I love it and and there's a phenomenon about what is it about a little novella that actually has been the most translated book on the planet mm -hmm. other next to the bible like what is that secret like how the writer didn't know that the artist didn't right. know that like the what made just, it resonate with so many people so and especially places. because it was such a personal <clears throat> story like from the author like so create one of the, the most translated books on the planet is actually a personal story hmm. that was in that was fictionalized in his imagination this way and so the personal in our experience is everything it's yeah. it's what feeds our it's our stories you know and so and maybe if you just told it like like just by here talking we'd be like oh this is boring this is just a guy and his girl and whatever but now we imagined it yeah and imagination to me is everything you know um it's how we imagine the world that we we can change. It's how we imagine our work. The imagination is 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 the best thing. Um, and his imagination with this particular story is really cool. It was a surprise for us, and our editor got was nominated as well, which was awesome. I mean, it was a surprise for me because actually I didn't know it was even submitted really. Oh. But uh, so when I found out, it was it was it was very cool. It was it, it's cool because a lot of work went into that film and. We built a beautiful relationship with the St. Exubery estate and Mark Osborne, who made the animated film, beautiful, Ken's like huge, you know, um, amazing film that there's something about 
if people can revisit this, whether you like it or not, um, fully understand it. I think there are such amazing messages in this little book, and I think it's really, you know, it's for adults. It's like my Pan's Labyrinth in a way. It's in novels, in a way, novellas, because it's, it's, it is for adults. It's not a children's book. Right. But it's been presented that way, and and that's the the intelligence of this of this person of telling a story in an imaginative way that 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 disguises itself as something else, but then penetrates everything. All the tra- all the different languages. When I was in Thailand, I was presented new versions, translations of the book in languages that are being lost. Wow. Indigenous languages in Thailand. Wow. That we don't know about. So two languages. So I have these copies of these two. You know. Like limited editions huh. of this book in this Amazing. new la- in this language that's being preserved. So, and what this book has done in terms of just literacy, mm. how many people have learned how to read just from this particular book, learned French from this book, fr- learn how to. It's beautiful because his message was just to break down the barriers of, of of language, and he writes a book that actually gets translated in all, all these, these languages, languages. and. So then all these people can actually feed into this message mm-hmm. that he has. And then I was posing this question like, well, even when a book does this great, why is the world like this? Yeah. Right? Which is a sad thing. So it was a question like, how would Saint Exubery know that his book is so celebrated and had all these messages and the world is actually in a state? Because it was like during World War II where mm-hmm. he was, this dude flew recognizant missions. How many artists do you know would actually mm-hmm. like get in a plane when they shouldn't be dry, flying a plane at all, physically, and going to search for like soldiers out there in the right. war, but you're an acclaimed best-selling novelist and writer and artist. Yeah. Like, like, you wouldn't see, you know, we're not gonna see Beyonce jump on a plane and like start looking for driving a mission herself. Mm-hmm. We're not gonna see, you know, Margaret Atwood really, I mean, she would probably get on the phone and do, I'm saying they'll do the, their sure. own revolutionary thing in their own way, but I'm saying that that physicality of entering war mm-hmm. in a plane, yeah. like you're going into battle, you're going to, you're going to get killed. Mm-hmm. So that's an individual and a state that I'm like, oh man, I love this, I love this. It's like the Salman Rushdie idea or these experiences I've had with artists that have been pinnacle points of like what they've had to go through or, you know, being threatened uh, for the art that they do or what a story that they're putting out mm-hmm. in the world. You know, Honor Verses was homage to Satanic Verses. Right. But it was also this thing of understanding for the first time. Beautiful being, film, by the way. I loved Honor Verses. Thank you. So gorgeous. Thank you. But being fearful for an author, I didn't, I didn't know mm-hmm. that he he wrote a story and people want to kill him. Mm-hmm. Like for me, in my age where I was, I'm like, oh my goodness, is this what it means? Like, so is it terrible? Like, this is what it means to like tell the truth or to be an artist or like y- your life? And then I'm like, yeah, you have to put your life on the line, commit to it. <laughs> and then it's and then in the back of my head, it's like this thing. It is, it's, that's how powerful it is though mm-hmm. too, right? How it can stir up such art, yeah, such uh, reactions from individuals. Scary and also beautiful, you know. Yeah. Mhm. Mhm. Amazing. Yeah. Well, this has been such a pleasure, a joy Man, to talk to you. Thank you. It's awesome. I talk so much. It was I like... love it. I, you know, listen. I love the sound of my own voice. I'm not gonna lie. I love to ask questions, but it's it's so special when I can just ask a question and then just sit and listen and learn and just awesome. hear about somebody's experiences and their career. It's been so lovely. And just watching your career too, because I have known you for probably close to like 15, 20 yeah, years. Yeah. 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 First as the actor and yes. then Nurse Fighter Boy, we supported at First Weekend Club yes, before abso- I was with First Weekend Club. Absolutely. First Weekend Club has been a sport from day one in, in, in all the films. And so I'm blown away by that commitment. And that's what I mean, like that kind of commitment is, is what it takes, mm-hmm. right? Like you can start something, but to maintain it and to, it just doesn't happen on its own. Yeah. Yeah. It really does take a village. It you know, really, it really, really, does. really does. It really does. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm, I'm grateful and, and, and I love that it's it's still 
following a mantra of like actually communicating and finding new ways of of, uh, of your commitment to Canadian cinema. Mm -hmm. It's just it's it's powerful. There's a lot of great talent out here, you know, and yeah, we're just we trying do. to be part of it and yeah. kind of lift lift them all up. So, in closing, Charles, what would you what would be your words of wisdom to <laughs> emerging artists Sorry. out there, and whether that is specifically for writers or directors or mm. just as creative people in general because you do right. have such a creative background. What would you say to somebody who came to you and said, I, you know, I want to make it in this industry. What mm. do I What do I need to do? I think there's different approaches, obviously. Mm -hmm. it, I think it's being honest with what you... It's hard to say that, too, when you're early on starting something is what do you want out of it? Like, you know, maybe you just want to get a date. And you want to be famous. Well, maybe, maybe okay. you want to just make someone laugh. Yeah. Maybe you it's want to valid. get an uh, emotional story that's been like something deep and buried. I, I, I think it's just committing yourself to to it, because the only way to truly find out if you're going to be successful or to do something or get to a certain place is that you have to like step off the ledge. Mm. I think you have to commit to it, and uh, it, to really know what it smells like what it feels like what it's like you can I don't think it's a it's a half stepping sort of thing you can do I know you have to we have to survive and we got to have judge but there's I mean we're inspired by all the stories by the person who lived in their car until they made it so I'm not saying you have to go live in your car or whatever but I'm saying like it's not easy doing any of this stuff mm -hmm. you know so if you want to make music, if you want to be a composer, if you don't know what you want to do, try a few things, but uh, but you have to commit to it, and um, and I think you know literacy reading is is everything. Literacy is like it's so it's it's so critical, like how we read things and interpret things, and how is it that we can all we have these eyesight if we do and. We can see something or a situation and then have different opinions about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think literacy, how we read and how we absorb stories and information and how we analyze and break it down, make us smarter and how we can ask certain questions and change our perspectives. So I don't know, I think a commitment to the craft is like, is actually a very human exploration and journey. So yeah, commitment's everything. Here you have it, folks. In in mm. art and in life, too, in life, right? Yes. You gotta commit, so Right? That's all. You gotta it commit is. to love. Yeah. Yeah. And you just exude love all over the place. And we love you at <laughs> First Weekend too. Club so thank much. So, so much. thank you for being I'm here. So joining me it. at the NFB in downtown Toronto. Yes. That's Mr. Charles Officer. Thank you. And that's it for us. That's awesome. Bye.